Hello, this is the first of three ABO podcasts giving you a flavour of what's been going on at the 2018 conference this year in Cardiff. 350 or so delegates are convening at the Millennium Centre in Cardiff Bay. It's cold, it's a little wet, but we're reassured that the sun will shine come the last day. More on that story in the final podcast. I should probably introduce myself. My name is John Jacob, uh, and in this first podcast, you'll hear from Sophie Lewis at Symphonia Cymru, an excerpt from today's keynote from British Council Chief Exec Sir Kieran Devan, and a reflection on the day's events from ABO Chairman Gavin Reid and PRS for Music's Harriet Wybaw. But before, as is customary for things like this, we need a delegate to tell us where we are and why we're here which is handy because earlier on today I found just the very person. Collaboration is a broad term. It's also something that happens in a variety of different places. Sometimes collaboration goes unnoticed. Sophie Lewis from Symphonia Cymru explained to me how one simple act of collaboration has benefited audiences in Wales. Sorry about the buzz, really annoying, isn't it? Really, really annoying. We will get that sorted out in the next podcast, promise. The keynote on day one was from British Council exec Sir Kieran Devan. Thorough, rigorous, fascinating and, speaking personally, inspiring. Just so you know, the excerpt from the entire speech included here runs to about 14 or 15 minutes. If you were to characterise the British Council and, you know, maybe me as an individual, I'd say I'd be a constructivist. It's, you know, how do we show through experience what the, what the best way of doing things is? How do we learn from other experiences, from our experiences internationally, what the best way of doing things is? So cultural relations that we're involved in is really around that. People, you know, if you read some of um, you know, the soft power books that people like quoting, they say it's about the power of attraction. How do you get those people out there to like what you like and therefore they'll do what you want to do, which is a bit instrumental. I think our view is it's about the power of example and it's about the power of experience. And it's about mutuality, it's about learning from each other. There are things which are done brilliantly in, in Russia, in the cultural sector that you know, we need to uh, learn from uh, here and vice versa. So, so Brexit was a shock, uh, you know, certainly for, for me uh, personally. But the question becomes what do we do? 
And we did a few things in the immediate aftermath of the uh, referendum. Uh, the first one was, coincidentally, we had just done a piece of research in the G20 countries on what young people think. And we re-ran that research afterwards. So we had 20,000 young people across the 19 countries of the G20, because you knew that, didn't you? Um, and we re-ran that research uh, afterwards just to see uh, what happened and what, what the difference was. Um, and we, we learned two things. The first one was that outside the European Union, young people, meaning 18 to 34-year-olds in, in this case, kind of didn't notice Brexit. We think it's the biggest thing that ever happened. They didn't really notice it. It's not, wasn't that big news in China. Um, the second thing was that within the European Union, it did make a difference. And the, the G20 members, other than the UK, um, Italy, France, and Germany, young people were really not uh, impressed by this. But they did differentiate. Um, they, they said really three things. First of all, we worry a bit more about what it means about British society. You know, are you a bit more anti-foreigner than we thought? They worried a bit about what it meant about UK politics. Um, you know, are you a bit more isolationist than we thought? They did not worry more about what they saw as the institutions which make Britain, Britain. They still love our universities. They still think you know, our music and our creative sector is to be admired. They drew a distinction. And for me, in that, there is some hope that this wasn't people saying, uh, we think that UK society you know, made a decision and therefore you know, all bets are off. This was actually, you know, this is just something in a complex situation and we can differentiate. And this was you know, young people. Um, so there is some hope and we need to understand what that means uh, a bit further. The second thing we did was we ran a series of conferences around um, Europe. We, uh, we had one in Berlin uh, very shortly after the referendum. We had another in Madrid, a third one in London. And we had in total roughly 500 leaders of universities, um, arts organisations, uh, scientific organisations, um, you know, government ministries, you know, from all member states. Um, at those conferences. And what we did was we, uh, we said the output of the third one needs to be a communique that we, all, we can all sign up to. Um, so in, in some ways that communique is nobody's precise opinion. It's the average of 500 different views. Um, but on the other hand, it is the average of 500 different views. Um, and we, we developed that. We brought a kind of a, some ideas into the first to the Berlin conference, and we carry the output into the Madrid conference, and we carry that to the uh, London conference. And we came out with a communique, which we then fed into um, the negotiating teams on both sides. But equally importantly, the 500 individuals and organisations who were involved, um, including some people in this room, um, carried it back to their culture ministries, education ministries, Minister of Science, uh, whoever it was. Um, so it might be worth uh, just spending a few moments thinking of, of those things, and some of them have already been mentioned, which are important enablers for what you do as um, orchestras. Um, we've touched on residency rights. And, you know, if you are a European artist in the UK or a UK artist in um, Europe, what does that mean and how does that work and what is, uh, you know, what's going to happen? So, and you, you've seen that being a major issue and major um, debate through the um, negotiation so far. Ease of movement, what I characterised, uh, and, and to uh, Dexy you, I'm not sure if they quite understood what I meant, as the free movement of cellos. Um, how do we make sure that the things which enable and reduce the friction in how you operate nationally and internationally, how do we make sure that that's uh, preserved? So it's the kind of free movement of ideas and the people who carry them free movement of talent and the people who have the talent. Um, and that's true whether you're a scientist, you're an educationalist, or you're an artist. You want to be able to do that because you know, that, is, that is your life, our life. You know, that is how we operate. Um, you know, our, our market is, is bigger than one country. Um, we talked about participation in multilateral programs. Um, now that could be Erasmus Plus for those of you who are familiar with it about um, young people moving to study in other countries, you know, outward movement, in inward movement. Um, we happen to be the UK agency and the office is just down the road here in, in Cardiff. 
Um, so we want, you know, our view and the view of the people in the room uh, is that ongoing participation in that multilateral programme. Horizon 2020 is one which enables a lot of the science collaborations um, that go on. And of course, Creative Europe. And there is that intent in principle, um, which was talked about in December and was a kind of a subtext in the Prime Minister's speech in Florence around intending to continue to participate you know, up to 2020 and ideally be beyond uh, as well. Now, if you look at the Creative Europe programmes, you know, roughly half of them have a UK partner. It's, it's really integral to how you know, the cultural sector in the UK operates. Um, the other recommendation was young Europeans and future generations. Um, we know through the referendum that there, uh, there was a disparity between um, how young people voted and older people um, voted. And the, what we were asking for was that young people's voice should be brought into the negotiations. So it wasn't young know, people my age who would exclusively be involved in forming policy because the majority of people of my age, even though I know very few of them, uh, did not vote Remain. Uh, so how do we capture you know, what the next generation wants because it's their future that um, is being decided here. Intellectual property, a uh, uh, subject dear to your hearts. Uh, qualifications, let's make sure that degrees continue to be recognised. Regulatory frameworks, well, you, you've seen a lot about that, about convergence and, uh, and not. And then the last one was uh, a kind of a plea for informed decision making. Please, can we do things on, on evidence? So, so th those messages from many of the great and the good of the cultural sector, the science sector, and the education sector across Europe have been carried back into you know, 28 capitals uh, and um, Brussels uh, as we go forward. So what we've been trying to do uh, in our small way, along with um, partners and trade associations and you know, Creative Industries Federation and Universities UK and Royal Society and, and so on, is, is make sure that those points of view are fed into the negotiating machine, you know, in all capitals, you know, in and uh, the Commission, uh, in in Whitehall uh, as well, um, and indeed uh, through the devolved governments who have a, a voice in in this. So there's a lot that's happening. Um, I think everybody is well aware of the consequences, and anything which makes life more difficult for you to operate as orchestras, um, I think, should be avoided. And you know, we, for our part, will uh, will do our bit um, on that. But I think we should be travelling optimistically. Uh, I, I think uh, DCMS are um, uh, clear, and the government is clear, that um, you know, the wish would be to continue to be part of uh, multilateral programmes and make sure that the uh, degree of convergence is as high as possible to enable this kind of free movement um, uh, of ideas and shallows uh, to, um, uh, to continue. Um, but we need to keep the, the debate going. Uh, I think we, we can't be complacent <coughs> uh, about it. Um, one of my worries is that you know, the sectors that you know, are dear to, to us and to you will be crowded out of the conversation by financial services or automotive supply chains or something else. That, you know, by the time you get to the agenda uh, you know, of you know, university students or um, the creative sector, that you know, just the, the bandwidth won't want to be there. So I think you know, it, it's incumbent on, on us to try and make you know, our case as frequently and uh, as importantly uh, as possible. Um, but for me, there is a bigger issue. Um, and it, it, it's, it's almost what was behind Brexit. And um, if I can um, maybe give you a slightly dramatic story. Um, some of you, I think, will know Martin Roth, tragically, the late Martin Roth, um, director uh, of the VNA before Tristram, um, who uh, happened to be one of our trustees. And at our away day, not last November, the previous one, so within days of Trump's election, um, Martin made a very impassioned intervention. Um, and Martin's German, for those of you who don't know him. Um, and what he said was, um, look, I'm not saying it's the 1930s, but in the 1930s, there were rooms of people like us saying it's not the 1930s. You know, they're never going to elect this Hitler guy. And the institutions are so strong, they'll deal with it, despite Weimar and everything else that's going on. You know, it, it'll be all right. 
And what Martin was saying was, look, there's a one in 10,000 chance, um, or a one in a thousand chance, whatever it is, but we don't want to be the people in 20 years' time that look back and say, well, I kind of knew there was something in the air, um, but I did nothing. And I was not so sure uh, about what I uh, thought of that uh, until that Enemies of the People headline uh, in the newspaper, um, you know, with the photograph of the three judges. And that was the 1930s. Um, but I still didn't know if it was being too dramatic. So I've been testing this question um, over the last 12 months or so, uh, talking to people. And, and it's, not, it's not about Brexit, it's about some of this kind of, um, you know, cities voted one way, sort of towns and villages voted another way. Um, older people voted this way, younger people voted that way. Um, and are we neglecting something in our societies? Um, and Brexit happens to be our version of it. Um, the American el election resulted in their version of it. Um, you know, President Macron was in town uh, recently, but you know, um, you know, the, ex you know, the what's called it, the right wing vote or the extreme right wing vote. You know, was quite strong in France. And then you can go to many, many other countries um, as well and think, are we, are we failing to do something quite big? Are we failing to make sure that um, the benefits of this kind of integrated global world that we all um, benefit from um, is being shared equitably across our societies? And if, if so, how do we do that? So, so this idea of carrying music to the um, parts of society uh, which wouldn't normally have access to it, and it's why the how I think of what you do is is so important. How do you know? How do we as the British Council make sure that you know because we work with the creative sector and education and so on that we're we're not just providing opportunities to young people who are kind of inherently international anyway? What about the wrong side of the wrong town uh, in you know the declining industrial town? Um, are we actually making sure that we can provide those opportunities and those international connections to those people in the way that, you know, if you're a language student at a, um, you know, a university down the road here, well, of course you're going to, you know, by definition, you're going to have an international experience because there'll be international students in the class with you. You know, you're learning a language, you're going to visit the country, etc. You know, are we are we failing in 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 some way? And if so, how how do we uh, do it? So I keep going back to um, the founding of the British Council, and if you work for the British Council, you're really bored of hearing me say this. Um, when we got our Royal Charter in 1940, so whatever you think about Brexit or anything else, there, things were a bit trickier in Europe in 1940. Um, and I was fascinated that in 1940, people in government went to the trouble of setting the British Council up as a separate organisation, giving it a royal charter. And I was trying to understand what that logic was. And there's some beautiful prose that's in a, in written in our very first annual report. It, it says that our role is to work with the cultural resources of the United Kingdom to foster the interchange of knowledge, ideas and discoveries. And the reason you want to do that is to create a basis of friendly knowledge and understanding between people. And why do you do that? Because that will make the world a better and a safer place. So they had this kind of, back to my political science, constructivist view. If you engage with people, if you understand people, and people who are different to you, then, and they understand you, this kind of concept of mutuality, of interchange of knowledge, ideas, and discoveries, not let me tell you about my wonderful ideas you know, and discoveries, but that interchange, how do we do that? And if we do that, we will make the world a better and a safer place. So if you look at this kind of issue that may be behind some of the things that we see happening in the world, a lot of it is about people not understanding each other. So how do we continue to use culture, to use art, to use music, to foster that understanding? Because that's what will help bring peace to parts of the world where um, there isn't peace, bring understanding where there isn't understanding, bring development where there isn't development, bring prosperity where um, there isn't um, prosperity. At the end of the first day of the ABO conference, Chairman and Scottish Chamber Orchestra Chief Exec Gavin Reid and PRS for Music's Harriet Weibel discussed uh, events. Just for reference, members of the Symphonia Cymru played in the foyer below us. Do you, you know each other? So no. You, you don't know each no, other? No, we don't it's know each other. It's our first meeting today. Yes. Okay, so why don't... Um, 
because we're lovely people, why don't we introduce each other? Can you tell me who you are and what you do and why you're here? Sure. I'm Harriet Weibel. I'm the Classical Account Manager at PRS for Music, where I'm responsible for supporting our classical members. So that's both composers and music publishers. Um, we provide business support, um, queries about royalties and licensing. And in addition to that, I run an education and outreach program across the UK for um, classical music creators. And what particularly interested you coming to the ABA conference? It's a fantastic opportunity to network and meet with orchestras who are really important stakeholders um, in, in the wider um, classical sector and community and very important in terms of our work with composers. Um, it's also um, an opportunity to meet with some of our licensees as well um, to develop our relationships there. And to hear some pan pipes as well. If I'm not mistaken, there are pan pipes in the background, which is a lovely thing. Um, uh, we'll come on to what you thought of some of the sessions shortly. Um, we have someone else with us. Can you tell me who you are, what you do, what you do, and why you're here? Uh, I'm Gavin Reed. Um, I'm the chair of the ABO, and I'm also the chief executive of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. So, as chair of the ABO, I'm here to host the uh, conference. Uh, and uh, to introduce, to welcome delegates and to introduce the first opening session and uh, to do one or two other introductions uh, during the week to um, give the AB award at the dinner tomorrow and to close the conference on Friday afternoon. As Chief Executive of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, I'm here to network, to meet friends, to meet colleagues, to make connections, uh, and to um, find out how everybody else in our world is getting on. And from that, from the Scottish Chamber Orchestra perspective, what, what particularly interested you about this year's conference? I realise you have an official role, so you, yes, I have you, no you, choice. you, you, you are required <laughs> to be interested. But I'm just wondering, that from, from the perspective of running an orchestra, what, what particularly interested you in this conference? Well, I, the think, issues I, that you're bringing? I, I think at some level it's just important that, that we're here. You know, the, the, what, 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 we've got record numbers of delegates this year and uh, they're coming from a number of different quarters but one of the things I, uh, I love as chair of the ABO is the fact that you've got senior, middle, junior colleagues in the organisation so it's not, it's not all senior management, it's not all one particular level so you get a great mix and I think it's important to play a part in that and to, 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 to contribute to the overall debate. Um, I think it's important that we, uh, that we meet each other and at, at, again at some level um, it's, it's about representation, it's about relevance uh, and it's about all, all of us being part of the conversation. Specifically this year, uh, the theme of collaboration I think is a strong one. It's an important one. Uh, the, the week can be dominated, every conversation can be dominated by Brexit at the moment, if we want it to be. Uh, and collaboration, how we work, how we move forward. Um, we, we, we often talk about collaboration and partnership as something nice to do. It's a really hard thing to do, so spending time with other people who are also trying to do it and to understand what works, what doesn't work, when to collaborate, when not to collaborate, um, is, I think, uh, it's always valuable learning. Do you, uh, Harriet, do you, do you come to this conference sort of seeking answers or, or do you think, is it a, m a much lighter touch experience for you? Is it that, you, that you're listening to, to different speakers and then coming up with thoughts afterwards? What's your experience? <coughs> I think for me the most important thing is being part of discussion and debate about um, current topics that affect the wider classical sector. That's what's really important to me, making sure that we're abreast of those, that we understand um, the various facets of the classical sector and that we can respond to those accordingly. Um, and what has uh, what have been your two big points this year? That this year, I mean from the first day. The conference has only just started. I think Obviously the theme of the conference being collaboration, it's, it's a hugely important point for me. It's very important for us at PRS for Music in terms of collaborating with other organisations and individuals. Um, I think it's also very important in for composers, um, so particularly that area of work that I do. Um, composers collaborating with performers, with programmers, um, and also potential commissioners and programmers collaborating together in terms of commissioning new music, um, 
ensuring repeat performances of works that's that's all very important and and vital to to continuing and i think sustaining careers for for composers today uh, Gavin, t- tell us about uh, tell us a sort of a summary of uh, Sir Kieran Devan's um, keynote because he was he was quite punchy. Well, uh, the thing that I uh, that stood out for me was the phrase which I had um, referred to at the end of uh, the session was travelling optimistically, which I think is a, a really uh, brilliant uh, phrase which I'm going to borrow and use. Um, you know, as I say. We it's 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 easy to get bogged down in Brexit and for it to be doom and gloom. And you know Julie Ward's comments just now about uh, the, the the European uh, countries are extremely sad. It's important that we hear that. Um, really important that we hear it. Um, and it's positive because we will. Uh, it, it gives us a, a a platform, a mandate to continue to engage and to continue to work with um, friends and colleagues in Europe but things are going to change and we don't quite know what's going to happen yet is it going to be a two year transition period or is it going to be as Julie um, wants a a ten year or generational transition we simply don't know, we don't know what the terms are going to be, the issues for Brexit are um, are very clearly defined for our sector they're they're fairly um, they're, they're fairly well defined, um, uh, and uh, they could well provide significant challenge for us, uh, and, ne- and have a negative impact. But actually, we ha- we have to travel optimistically. I, l- I, l- I love the phrase. <laughs> it's clear that I, you get. I really <laughs> I really get it. I mean, it, it's it's a. But really what is it, what is the currency of it for you then? I mean, clearly that phrase is is, going, is very valuable for you. But how is that useful for you when you're running an orchestra? Well, um, at the yep. moment, uh, the, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra has got a number of um, tours in the planning uh, stages uh, in Europe with, with uh, venues and promoters in Europe for the next um, two or three years. And I hope very much that whatever legislation comes to pass, whatever circumstances are put into play, we will continue to be able to uh, maintain those partnerships, have return visits, develop new relationships across Um, Europe. But equally, we have tours in the planning in uh, other parts of the world, Um, non-EU. We're we're not alone in that. So I think the the two things that really stood out for me in Kieran Devane's um, comments today uh, was that phrase, we must remain optimistic and positive throughout, There there are opportunities, and engage everywhere. You know the thing, the the, the 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 comment that came up in the last session just now about does this mean a re-engagement with the Commonwealth countries? Mm. And his response was, "Yeah, sure, why not? You know, it's not it's not a world of one club anymore. It's a it's a world of engaged with lots of different partners and lots of different clubs. Now, there's a danger that's a bit, um, you know, uh, uh, diverse, and you just opportunistic." and you're just seeking opportunities here and everywhere. Everybody wants, as was talked about, everybody is knocking on China's door. There are lots of cities that we, that we I've, I've toured to some of them with, with um, orchestras that um, are not familiar. They're not household names, yet they've got seven or eight million people mm. living there, and they've got these phenomenal concert halls. And yes, they're content hungry. They're also audience hungry. And you know we, they, we, we have to work with partners in China to see where the audiences are coming from, and and it's, it, that is going to take a while. I was I was surprised about how uh, I realised that we'd started talking about the keynote, and now we're talking about the panel discussion. So, and that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, but I was surprised about the impact that that fresh fresh perspective had on me. I had gone into that discussion thinking inevitably doom and gloom about about Brexit, but actually. Uh, hearing about that and other territories, almost, almost felt a little bit relieved. I wonder whether I'm unusual in that, and whether I'm being slightly simplistic about it. I mean, from my perspective, I think it was great to hear more about the opportunities and more about the positives. Um, when I think it's very easy for us all to think about the challenges that might be. Um, already facing us and, and may face us in the future. Um, so I think from, from that perspective, it's an extremely positive way to start the conference. Mm. Um, 
I'm also struck by how there they, it felt like there was a bit of a call to arms, like a low-level call to arms there that everybody needs to, well, inevitably collaborate uh, in order to um, bang the drum abroad. Forgive the pun, that was terrible. But um, I wonder whether people at the conference and people who work at orchestras are feeling as though it's a collective thing or whether we all individually have to do something to make things better. Do you, do you have a view about that? Um, I, uh, at, a, at a broad level, um, not particularly specific to, to this situation, I think we all have an individual responsibility to make change, whatever the situation. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if yeah, we I take agree. individual and organisational responsibility, that grows into collective responsibility. And what, <coughs> what individual responsibility, how, what would that look like? Um, uh, uh, I know it's a rotten question. In, in sorry, uh, in, in terms of running orchestras, um, continuing to look for opportunities amongst the whole gamut of opportunities that and, and, and different work streams that we have, continuing to look for opportunities to um, collaborate with um, partners internationally, be that within the EU or elsewhere. There is a um, sort of uh, slight caveat red flag here that um, uh, we have this great uh, product to use to be commercial uh, uh, and as our friends in France mentioned at the end of that last session um, they regard the UK's orchestral world as a great model that's that's terrific and we can um, uh, benefit from that and uh, maximize that but but particularly when we're, we are working in uh, countries which have a, have a, have their own extremely rich cultural heritage. So India, for example, um, uh, is a is a good example. We've got to be really careful that we're not simply going in and placing our st uh, our thing in their country and saying, you know, this is this is brilliant. This is what you need. It's got to be, as Catherine McDowell said, a two way street, a two way thing. How can we learn more about? other cultures and bring those back to our own country. When we go to um, uh, uh, countries, how can we actually spend time there? Not simply the old model of a different city every night, do a concert, go away again, no, never actually, never the twain shall meet, but actually spend time in places and build personal relationships. That's another takeaway from mm. this afternoon, is it's not about organisation to organisation, it's about person to person. I agree, absolutely, and I think, um, the really useful thing about conferences like the ABO conference is while it's very important that everybody takes individual responsibility, um, it also brings people together in one place and I think gives people the opportunity to very easily share what they're doing in addition to the to the day-to-day -day collaborations that they have um, with other stakeholders um, and ensure that people and organisations aren't working in silos and that we are all also collectively working towards um, common goals. Thanks to everybody who contributed to the first ABO conference podcast. If you liked what you heard, be sure to click the like button and share accordingly. Follow the ABO account on YouTube for the latest podcasts. This has been a thoroughly good bit of production for the Association of British Orchestras.